Hello, I'm Alan Cozen, and welcome to Things We Said Today, our weekly radio show about all things to do with the Beatles, their past, their present. If we get an inkling of the future, we'll tell you, unless we're like sworn to secrecy, and then we'll tell you anyway, probably. <laughs> I'm joined by my regular co hosts, Ken Michaels, who you know as the host of the syndicated Beatles radio show, Every Little Thing. Hello, Ken. How are you doing? Good, Alan. How are you? I'm um, just fine. Uh, Steve Marinucci, whose work you know from examiner.com, where he's the Beatles examiner and examiner of several other pop culture topics. Great source for news, and uh, you should keep up with it. Um, Steve, how are you doing? Pretty good, Alan. How are you? Hey, everyone. Oh, good. Hey. And Al Sussman, who is a very long-time contributor to Beatle Fan Magazine, now executive editor of Beatle Fan Magazine, and an author in his own right. And how are you doing, Al? Hi, Alan. Pretty good. How about you? Not and hello, th- and hello there, everybody. So um, we have a lot to talk about today. The principal topic we were going to get around to, and we will get around to, is um, basically the interplay of influences between the Beatles and the Beach Boys and Bob Dylan, principally because, uh, apart from that always being an interesting topic, uh, last week, I think on May 16th, uh, was the 50th anniversary of the release of both Pet Sounds and Blonde on Blonde. Don't hear Blonde on Blonde being cited that much in the Beatles story, but Pet Sounds certainly was. There was a lot of direct interplay between the Beatles' feelings about Pet Sounds and the Beach Boys' feelings about what the Beatles were up to and how that all fed each other. Uh, so we'll get to that. May 24th is also uh, Mr. Dylan's birthday. Yes, 75th, 75th birthday. Mm-hmm. Yes, indeed. But we also wanted to revisit a little bit last week's interview with Philip Norman and discuss the book a bit, because we didn't really have much of an opportunity to do that since we were interviewing him. I mean, certain aspects came up that you know might have been clear about what we thought about certain things. But you know, normally when we're doing a book like... Uh, you know, Chuck Gunderson's book, it's kind of clear from the questioning that, you know, we really admire the work and the detail and the research and all of that. And um, we were a little more um, maybe diplomatic with Philip's book. So we we wanted to just sort of talk about our uh, individual reactions to the book itself. Um, and I don't know, I, I put it that way, but maybe one of the others um, was just thrilled with it. So we'll we'll see as we go around. I thought I'd start, <laughs> seeing as I'm host today. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> Here's the thing. Uh-oh. You know, I found, I mean, as you, you might remember from my, I questioned him about, for instance, you know, the, the sequence of events that led to their being signed to Parlophone and the, the chronology about Ringo. And um, it struck me that, you know, he hadn't even actually read Mark Lewison's Tune In. And that, to me, I mean, speaking as an author myself and and a journalist, I really can't quite understand that. I mean, um, I admired Shout when it came out. I really liked it. I mean, in terms of Beatles books that were around at the time, it really was the best. I mean, Hunter Davies was great, but it only went up to 1968, and it was sort of boldlerized by the Beatles themselves. And the other books were really just sort of quick paperback deals, and it wasn't, you know, that informative. And and Shout, I thought, advanced the game seriously. It appears almost from this book as if Philip decided not to do any further research on the Beatles after Shout, even though the whole Beatles research world, thanks largely to Mark Lewison, um, has exploded, you know, since Shout came out. And, uh, you know, there's an awful lot of information about the, you know, up to 1962 in Tune In that I would think any Beatles researcher, any Beatles author would have to take into account. And he just doesn't. So I found that a little shocking. And there were things in there like um, he, in talking about yesterday, and the composition mm. of yesterday and the recording, he says it was released in the United States, credited solely to Paul McCartney. Now, a lot of 
our listeners, I'm sure, who live in the United States have the single with the picture cover with all four Beatles on it. It says Beatles in big letters on the top. It says Beatles on the label. Songs credited Lennon McCartney. And I can't quite figure out, you know, if you're writing that sentence in a book, you know, at some point, don't you have to stop and say, let me check that. You know, mm-hmm. Am I absolutely sure about that? That's a little strange that in the middle, middle of the Beatles era, they would have released a Paul McCartney solo single someplace in someplace in the world, but in a huge market, you know. So things like that. And, uh, you know, to talk about the, the good things, I mean, as Philip himself pointed out, um, he did interview Lee Eastman extensively, and that information really is all new, and it's important. Um, so there is that. I mean, I have to give him that. And the interviews with um, Jim McCartney's second wife, Angie and and their daughter Ruth, Mm -hmm. you know, those were kind of, you know, they they helped expand the picture a bit too. And uh, so, you know, I'm not saying the book is absolutely worthless, but I I have a a real hard time with a book about one of the Beatles. It doesn't take into account the latest research on the Beatles. So over to Al. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I I was thinking uh, that... I'm not sure how long how long this book took to to write, but at some point since let's see it was within the, within the last two years the tune in came out. I would have you know if it had been me I would have said okay time out here let me let me see what what is in this book and you know before I in a sense go with the you know the the established story which is what he did in this book you know it's uh it it's 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 very surprising and 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 you know there's a, a you could say that there's a fair amount of arrogance in that that he was that mm-hmm. you know that he simply refused to go with the the what is now the accepted story you know mm-hmm. and and it's uh, you know as far as the you know the, the the rest of the book itself i mean there are some there as you said there are some aspects of it that are that are good uh the the fact that he he was able to flesh out our our view of jim mccartney is very good uh he was also able to kind of flesh out our collective portrait of linda quite a bit but there's the the main problem i have with the book is that there's precious little about music Mm -hmm. in in there you know it's it's you know considering that it's a book a biography of a musician there's not a whole lot about about music in here you know it's uh and and also as i as i brought up to uh to philip the amount of material given over to the whole heather mills saga and especially the divorce proceedings the amount of pages upon pages upon pages <laughs> of yeah. of of the divorce brief is ludicrous to me you know, apart from being very light on the music, another aspect of that is that you wouldn't know from reading the book that this is one of the great innovative bass players of all time. You know? Very true. Mm-hmm. I very, mean, it, very... he does mention that he played the bass, but it doesn't go much farther <laughs> than that. What's funny is the way, the, you know, the way the early reaction to the book, I mean, pointing at, pulling out all the, the juicy tidbits and everything, uh, because mm. it seems like, unfortunately... That's kind of what he was aiming at, and that's really that's really sad. I mean, uh, you know, given all the good things about the book, I mean, the the music thing doesn't irritate me so much because there are places to to get music information about McCartney, and maybe from somebody that's uh, you know a more music oriented writer. Um, but it's too bad that he. Um, that he, you know, that apparently a lot of people are looking for gossip stuff out of the book. I mean, he basically stuck with his journalism roots and tried to be, tried to do exactly what the title said, The Life. 
you know, which, I mean, maybe taking the, the whole thing a little too literally, but it's just too bad that there's, there is so much gossip and, and, you know, not to mention the, you know, the errors, I, the errors thing, you know, I mean, that's, that's going to happen in, in every book. There's always going to be a problem with, with Beetle books. No man, even anthology, you know, we have the, you know, there are issues with that, but, um, yeah, you know, it's just, it's just weird. It's weird. It's mm. well, you know, it, it's the, the, um, the number of errors. I think that's the, that's the thing, you know, given that this is a, a man who wrote a biography of the group mm-hmm. and a biography of John Lennon, the number of really careless errors that are mm-hmm. in here are kind of, you know, kind of intolerable. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, and, and actually, I didn't think there was quite as much gossip as 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 one might think. You know, obviously, you know, the pre-publicity really played up the mm-hmm. re- the revelation, if if that if you want to call it a revelation, that Paul slept with a lot of girls in the '60s. You know, wow. which which we've known for you know for a very long time. But there there's not really much in the way of gossip even even in all of that stuff about heather it's not really gossip it's just simply you know <laughs> dredging up what we know about about her and also and 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 then as i said this numbing detail on the divorce uh, case when those stories first started coming out i went wait a minute you know i'm reading through this book and and you know he didn't it didn't seem that way <laughs> but i mean they they of course pulled all that stuff out to get everybody interested in the book oh, like of course. like a, like it was a, a national enquirer book and it's not you know mm-hmm. yeah no, that much you know I, I if i i didn't mean to give that intention but i mean uh, you know impression but you know so, so that, that go ahead Alan. so ken well, move to ken. You know, the, the book has a uh, you know good and bad um, but the bad, I would say, I have to just reiterate what you guys said. And what you had said last week, Al, on right. the show, is what, you know, when, when you consider the music takes a backseat to everything else. Yeah. The reason I admire Paul McCartney most of all is for his work as a musician and as right. a songwriter. Mm-hmm. And that doesn't mean you have to go track by track to every song he's ever written, mm-hmm. but there's very little devoted to that. And I could care less about Paul's sex life. <laughs> it really is nothing, you know, that interests me at all. I mean, yeah, a young guy in his 20s and the biggest man in the world, you think he's going to have a lot of sex? I think so. I don't think that's uh-huh. going to shock anybody. You know, finding out that um, Rory Storm's mother liked to comb Paul's legs. You know, is that really all that interesting? Is it that essential to find that out? I'd much rather find out information about his music than anything else. Mm-hmm. But... Like Philip had said in the interview that we did with him, this is more a character analysis of Paul. Mm -hmm. And I think it gives you a pretty good description of what he's like, because let's face it, he's a very complicated person. And, as Philip also said, very misunderstood. And, you know, there's so many times when I think I know Paul McCartney well, and then I'm baffled by something that he's done. So, you know, I don't know. I think by reading this book, I understand Paul a little bit better, but... There's always going to be a part of Paul that I may never understand, and maybe it's meant to be that way because part of him is private. Uh-huh. Not everything is public, you know. And and kind of there's something Philip said uh, on the show that that I've been saying uh, occasionally for years, which a lot of people don't think about, but there are similarities personality-wise between Paul and John, and a lot of people might uh-huh. think they're complete opposites, but I think that that Philip brought that out in the book especially the insecurity part yes. for the yes. two of them. And I think that's really interesting and something that fans uh-huh. should know about. It's not yeah. like they're, 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 not, they're not polar opposites, John and Paul. Musically, there's a lot of differences. Musically, there are some similarities. They're two of the, uh-huh. the greatest yeah. you know, melodic writers of all time. Sure. But, um, and uh, I will say one thing just in response to the, the interview that Philip did with us. And this is something that I'd, I'd like our listeners to try to understand because... You know, we're trying to do a show that hopefully is somewhere in the realm of one hour. And whenever somebody, if we have somebody as a guest and they say something that we don't agree with, there are so many times I want to go back and, and, and respond to it. But I also have to be mindful of the clock. 
and also to give everyone a chance to talk and to ask mm -hmm. questions. And mainly, the conversation should be about the book. When Philip said what he said about George Harrison in the yeah. interview, that, that he pretty much, he, he's nowhere in, in, on the yeah. same level of John and Paul, and the great songs that George Harrison came up with were really because of the magic rubbing off from John yeah. and Paul. You know, I, I thought if I had responded to that, then the rest of the show could have been a conversation. I was, wait, I was waiting for that to happen, as a matter of fact. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, it could have been. And, and strangely enough, if I don't know if you guys remember when um, Cloud Nine came out, he got an awful lot of TV coverage and interviews. And one of the mm -hmm. people who was interviewed about Cloud Nine was Philip Norman, who went on, uh, I can't remember which show it was, but since, you know, as the biographer of, you know, as the author of Shout, they had him on there to talk about Cloud Nine. And what he said then was, you know, if you want to know about the Beatles, you really have to talk to George because Paul has his own story. John isn't with us anymore. Ringo doesn't remember. George is the key to it all. So, okay, he wouldn't you know, be able to talk to George now, too, but you would think that if that was his opinion, the idea of looking into George might have been more interesting. Yeah, really. And also, it's very obvious from talking to him that he doesn't know Paul's solo music that well at all. No. And probably doesn't know any of the solo music. The fact that he thought Pure McCartney was a, a new release, I mean, that was a that was a major, you know, major mistake right there. You know, you mean you mean new compositions? New compositions. Yeah. 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 Right. yeah. And uh, yeah, and just to to mention a couple of songs from Paul's solo career, like "Dear Friend," representing the best of his solo music, and going with the easy choice of "Band on the Run." You know, you don't really have to know all that much about Paul's solo career to make a statement like that. So um, I do find that, unfortunately, a lot of people who are supposed to be experts, even people who write books on the Beatles, don't know the solo music that well. And, I, you know, just certainly from the interview we did with Philip, I could, I could tell he doesn't really know Paul's solo music. I think this was done sort of as an apology to Paul because Shout was viewed by some people as being very biased towards John, and he even admitted it. So I think that was the main purpose behind it. But I do think the book has some merit, because it, it is a good character analysis. And the stuff about the Eastmans in, in this book is very interesting, mm -hmm. about the whole lawsuit and you know the dissolving of the Beatles. And there's some things in there I never knew before. Um, John Eastman, or was it Lee Eastman? One of them had threatened... Uh, Capitol Records or EMI that um, if the McCartney album didn't come out when Paul wanted it to, that, that he'd go to CBS with Clive Davis. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, that kind of thing was new. And the whole bit about the court case where, and in fact, Paul has brought this up a number of times about the Beatles. One thing he's very proud of is that he looked at the Beatles as being the ultimate democracy, where every decision was made by four people in agreement. And mm -hmm. somewhere uh, you know, in the chapter about you know, the court case, it had said something where initially John and the other three had agreed to having the Eastmans represent the Beatles. Mm -hmm. Remember that? Mm -hmm. and, right. and then John turned things around and made it more a majority vote, which mm -hmm. it never was. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, so that I found really interesting. The mere fact that Paul always brings up that democracy thing. He said it a number of times. So, you know, this is how we, certainly he remembers the way the Beatles handle things. And since he said it so many times, it has to be it has to be true. Uh, so, um, well, so, George Martin said lots yeah. of times that he didn't know Ringo was coming to the session. So. Mm. Right. But it does seem to be the way they 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 did things that it had to be unanimous i mean i'm i'm sure someone can find an example of where it wasn't but mm. uh, but still that i mean that's the general impression that that they always gave so we should probably move on at this point to the next topic before we get to the beach boys and dylan which was simply to point out that um there's an interview online with conan and mark lewison that it's an hour and a half interview on Sirius Jibber Jabber, and uh, 
you know, it's uh, no great revelations. I mean, he's not going to tell you what's going to be in volume two and volume three. Um, but it's a very interesting conversation. And uh, it's an hour and a half of the Beatles being talked about seriously by someone who's done an awful lot of research. And uh, it it's uh, an hour and a half not wasted. So you should look it up. Uh, Steve has links to it on his uh, Beatles Examiner page on Facebook. And I guess if you, you just Google search for Sirius Jibber Jabber Conan and Mark Lewis and you'll find it. Um, anyone have comments? I did an, I did an article in the and there's a direct link to it in right. there. So you can't find it. But I, I couldn't believe how – I mean the really nice thing about that was it was intelligent. It was mm. an incredibly intelligent discussion. Mm. I mean and usually in interviews like that you expect you know the author to – be reasonably intelligent but in this case both sides were incredibly i mean it was just great hearing the comments from from both conan o'brien and from mark lewis and in the you know the way they got you know the way they bounced off each other it was it was really fantastic well, they're very um, clear that conan is a serious beetle maniac who you know doesn't just mm-hmm. vaguely know the story he knows all the details you know mm-hmm. we should probably ask mark if there were outtakes from that <laughs> because i mean there is that was just wonderful that was really and then coming on top of the stephen peebles interview i mean that was like two back-to-back you know, treasures for people, uh, you know, interested in listening to some serious discussion. I mean, outside of our show. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it was just, it was, it was great. Uh, it was really, really good. And, you know, kudos to both gentlemen. And, uh, you know, hopefully, and he does have somebody that uh, we were talking before the show, and it, they, somebody was saying they hadn't heard if Conan did other interviews like right. that. He has. But that's the first one. I looked very quickly over the list of other people he's done, and I there really wasn't anybody like Lewis and in there. I mean, the, the great thing about this was he could never have, if he had had Lewis and on his show, he could never have done this. Ever. Oh, no. It would have been, a, right. so would that, have been an eight-minute segment or something. Right. You know, and and they never would have gotten as deep as they did, and that was what was so cool about this is that they were able to get really deep into the subject. Well, that's the great so. thing about having a website where you can put extra material on there, because there's so many interviews I've done where I put uh, yeah. a few excerpts into my radio show, but that isn't even ten percent of the interview, and I tell people to go to my website to hear the rest. That's the beauty of having a, a website like that, and not only that, but you know, Mark Lewis and being such a higher intelligence you know when it comes to a beetle fan and a scholar so much of the questions that conan would ask would not be geared towards the mainstream you know so mm-hmm. it's it's the perfect outlet for something like that and i will say one other thing bouncing off of what you said alan that that um there weren't revelations in this interview the thing is that the information that mark has come up with with the first volume alone there's so much interesting stuff that he came up with then that if he brings it up in this interview, it's still nice to hear that because it's still fresh. And oh, it's sure. Not, yeah. yeah. It's not commonly known stuff. So right. um, I'll tell you one thing that I found interesting, which I, I never thought about before, was that um, Mark brought up the fact that the Beatles were influenced by Goffin and King as songwriters. And we all know that. And certainly by the time the Please Please Me album was recorded, um, you know, they had Goffin and, Goffin and King in mind in terms of the songwriting style. But Mark had said one thing that Goffin and King did was that they'd write a song that might be a negative or something bad going on in the relationship, but the song would still be upbeat. Mm-hmm. And the Beatles kind of yeah. copied that. In fact, that bounces off of what Philip Norman said, you know, last week on our show when he talked about I'm a Loser, which sounds like a happy song, even though it's not. Right. You know, and uh, I'm thinking about a song like Misery, you know, yeah. where a relationship has gone bad, but you, it doesn't feel like a sad song. <laughs> you know, so mm-hmm. just hmm. picking up on that from what Mark said, I found that interesting. Yeah. Let me just say quickly, I'm on the website where he has all the uh, all the jibber jabbers. He's got, uh, looks like 19 of them. They're on teamcoco.com. Among the others, he's got um, Mel Brooks. Michael Lewis, uh, who did uh, Moneyball. He's got Jack White. He's got Peter Goralnik. I think that's one I'm going to have to listen to. Oh, yeah. Um, 
yeah, um, Judd a Apatow, Nate Silver, and uh, uh, Martin Short. Uh, those are just a few of the ones that he's got there. So, um, and Ken Burns. Did I mention Ken Burns? Ken Burns is also there. So, there's yeah, there's there's a uh, for those for anybody that's looking for some good discussion. That's who he has, um, and the Lewison thing is there too. So, can I say one more thing anyway. about this interview? Mm -hmm. The thing that I love a lot about this interview is that Conan, very much like when I interviewed Mark, what I loved a lot about Tune In is that the Beatles story in their early years is like going through a maze. It really is, where any number of things could have happened where they could have changed course. And Conan brings that up, you know, and it's just so fascinating in terms of the history that, you know, one thing, if it had been done differently, it could have offset everything else. So he's fascinated by that, as am I, as a, are all of us who have read the book. So, um, you know, he's just blown away by that whole thing. And also, you know, how difficult the Beatles were, you know, as people and, and, how, and how they could have broken up several yeah. times. Yeah. I also liked how he mentioned the fact that he didn't get ahead of the he stayed within the years in the book mm. so that. You know, he did. In other words, the first book is a is a like a block, and he didn't get ahead of himself at all. Mm -hmm. um, well, so, and I thought that was interesting. He mentioned too. that uh, when when we had him at the fest in New York in February of 2014, he mentioned that uh, because he he mentioned that he you know in doing the second book, he was you know had not done any sort of advanced research aside aside from interviews. Uh, but hadn't done any advanced research. I mean, he even asked me, frankly, he even asked me for a copy of my book <laughs> so that he would have wow. uh, yeah. some some perspective on the 101-day the, the period that I deal with in there. Yeah. Um, but it's, you know, it, it, it is very interesting that he basically just deals with the one period that he's dealing with right at that at that moment and is not going you know f farther afield than that so which was which leads which reminds me of one thing he said in the interview is that he would never write a book on an american an american event for example like the kennedy assassination mm -hmm. because he as a british as a britisher he has the perspective from a british man and not from an american right. so and which which would make your book very useful to him in that regard right so, yeah, that was, yeah. There were all sorts of things that that conversation brought out that I, I had not even considered that I thought were, were really interesting. It really kind of had it gave a lot of background to the book that, you know, that you might not have known. And, mm. and it is such an amazing story because of the fact that, yeah, uh, if, you know, if it hadn't been, if, if you know, if Brian Epstein had uh, had not been, there at that particular moment in time in Liverpool in in the fall of 1961 mm -hmm. at a point when the group was you know had had really kind of reached a crossroads if George Martin had not been at EMI at that particular moment in time yeah. if if mm -hmm. or if various and sundry things had not happened one way or the other the story very likely would not have panned out in the way it did and right. that's what makes it just an, it's really an amazing story. And timing was everything. Right. Exactly. <laughs> it really was. Brian mm -hmm. came along just at the right moment when and the Beatles just at the right him. moment. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so and so did Ringo and so did George Martin. Mhm. Mm mhm. Mm yeah. Well, I think what I meant by there are no revelations is, you know, obviously we're all sort of waiting to hear what's going to be in book two since we have to sure. wait till 2020 for the book to come out. Um, you know, and he's just not going to tip his hand. Um, I actually I spoke to him recently and tried to get him to tip his hand. And I said, you know, what are you finding? And he said, I, I'm finding incredible stuff. And I said, anything um as incredible as the story of how they got signed to Parlophone. <laughs> and he thought for a second and he said, yes. And I said, can you give me a hint? Uh, no. Of course not. <laughs> so, 
So yeah, you know. God, like, even even you, he won't even tell you. I mean, that's that's bad. Yeah, look. That's, yeah. That's, <laughs> yeah. Are you sure? Did Mark tell you 2020 for the book? Didn't he say 2020 in the past? Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's a long well, time like from now. <laughs> <laughs> it's only, I'm not, I, I, only I, I, four I, years. He did now. say, "Okay, here's a bit uh, okay. of uh, potential news." He d- he did say that conceivably the distance between books two and three won't be as big because he's researching them together in a way. And I mean, he kind of has to because look, yeah. Tom Barrow just died last week. Right. That's a another thing that maybe we should mention. You know, he wasn't. George Martin or Brian Epstein, but he played a very significant role in the Beatles, you know, getting the word out. Uh, They were just starting and also getting John out of lots of scrapes, John particularly. Mm -hmm. Um, right. And not to mention, I, I, I wrote his obit for the Times. and uh, you certainly, certainly did. It was I thought, and, a very good one. You know, the, the, one yep. of the things that I singled out is one of his most important contributions to Beatles history as such is he recorded the Candlestick Park concert and um, you know with the times they like us to put links to things in the stories and I didn't do right. the links this mm. but whoever did it linked to the entire Candlestick Park show so uh. that was, that was a very nice touch <laughs> hmm. How about although yeah, you, you, must be, you must be getting tired of doing obituaries it does sort of bother me that for me to appear yeah. at the top Someone has to have died, but um, exactly. But it's you know it's partly what I'm doing. I mean, I'm living up here in Portland, Maine, and it's, you know uh, there are a lot of composers and things that I'm working on now because they need them. You know, they need for them to be done, and uh, uh, and then when it's a Beatles thing like Tony Barrow, um, you know, they'll call in and say, you know, do you think we should do this, and do you want to do it? And uh, sure, you know, I mean, I'm happy to do it. I mean, I'm not happy that the person died, but, you know, it's I like being... The great thing about writing obits, and Steve, I don't know if you did that when you were working for a newspaper, but you you get really to sit and reflect on what made the person important, what their big contributions were, mm-hmm. and uh, mm-hmm. and in, in a certain way, it's kind of gratifying, you know? You're... you're you're sort of reminding people of what they may have known at one point and forgotten or what they might not have known at all. I mean, I'm sure a lot of readers of that obit didn't know who Tony Barrow was before they read it. Right, you know? mm-hmm. right. When uh, John died, I, di- I participated in the big section that the, the Mercury News put out. And, of course, uh, you know, since the end when George died, too. So uh, I did, you know, I did, I did do some of that, but not as much. I mean, I've done more up for the Examiner, obviously, than I than I did back then. But yeah, you do, you do. I mean, especially with with really big celebrities. I mean, and we've had God knows our share this year. Yeah, already. Mm-hmm. But, mm-hmm. Anyway. So shall we move on to the Beach Boys and Dylan and the Beatles? Sure. Yes. You know, I, what's always seemed fascinating to me about particularly this group of people, also you throw in the birds and, and some others, is that you had, and the Stones, the major acts of the time all interacting to each other and playing off what each other did and trying to top, you know, the, the last release by whoever it was that they admire. And um, I don't know, I don't, I don't think that happens as much or in quite the same way today. You know, it, it just sort of floored me to realize that Blonde on Blonde and Pet Sounds came out on the same day, you know? Yeah. And then if they... I wasn't, I wasn't aware of that either. I mean, I... It, well, it, actually... actually waited a couple of months, it could have been Revolver too. you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, as it turns out, and this is our friend uh, Robert Rodriguez did some sleuthing on this. Uh, actually, Blonde on Blonde uh, didn't actually reach the record stores until sometime in June. Mm. Uh, May 16th was the uh, the official release date, but there was at the last minute a, uh, a, 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 a dubbing session on fourth time around. Huh. And that held the album up, and so it didn't actually reach stores until, so I guess, probably the end of June. But the the uh, the first two singles, uh, "Rainy Day Women" number 20, 20, uh, 12 and twenty five, whatever it was, and uh, and I want thirty five. Thank you, <laughs> and uh, and uh, and I want 
keep those numbers. And safe. I want you. They, they were already out by the middle of June, or the middle of the, by the middle of May. I know that for certain. So someone uh, could have gone to a record shop and found Blonde on Blonde and Yesterday and Today on the same day, perhaps. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, very possibly. Yeah, very, very possible. Mm. So, um, can you want to talk about the influence of Pet Sounds? Well, maybe what Rubber Soul and Pet Sounds and Pet Sounds on Pepper and. That yeah, well, it, like you were saying, everything bounced off each other. I know that when the Beatles did Rubber Soul, Brian Wilson listened to it, and he was blown away by it. And uh, the advancement in the songwriting and in the production, and he said, God, what are we going to do? And that helped to inspire Pet Sounds. Mm-hmm. And then Pet Sounds helped to inspire Sgt. Pepper. So what's kind of interesting about mentioning those albums is that at no point did Revolver even mention. It was almost kind of like it wasn't noticed. Um, well, because the the dates kind of work out where Revolver would have been pretty much done by the time Pet Sounds came out. Oh, okay. You know, although I believe Philip Norman says that it influenced Revolver, not Sergeant Pepper. Well, yeah. the story has always been, and this is Paul's story, is that he he had heard, um, you know, he had heard an early an early pressing uh, of of Pet Sounds, and when he heard God Only Knows. He literally cried, mm-hmm. and that it was that you know the 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 reaction that he had to to God only knows greatly influenced him in the recording of Here, There, and Everywhere. Aha. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now George Martin said uh, he, uh, he there's a quote he said uh, they they talking about the Beach Boys come high on my list, and God only knows I think is my favorite track. So. I was reading. I was looking into uh, Dominic Priori's uh, book on Smile, and um, actually, the birds had a little bit to do with Rubber Soul because of the fact oh, that sure. the Beatles used the fisheye lens photograph on the cover, taken from uh, similar to what the birds had done mm-hmm. on uh, on uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Tam- Mr. Tambourine, Mr. Tambourine Man. Man. Right. Yeah. Right, so there's a whole, you you know you mentioned the birds, Alan. There, the, the, there's a whole circle going on there with that. Um, well, yeah, and it was it was really after Hard Day's Night that David Crosby decided that they needed a twelve string too. You know, there's a lot of mm-hmm. back and forth between all in every which way. And of course, and of course, the Beatles and the birds got together when they came when the Beatles came to L.A. So. Yeah, I mean, there's there's so much interaction, and actually, and and actually, later on, the whole when the disintegration of when Smile fell apart, that was due in fact partially to the upcoming release of Sgt. Pepper. Brian had so much pressure on him, on it uh, to get the album out that um, it fell apart. That's why one of the reasons why it fell apart, because he was you know feeling too much competition from the Beatles, which is really kind of sad. Yeah. Um, but And also, I yeah. remember hearing that Paul has said that with Pet Sounds, he was listening to the bass that what yeah. Brian was doing, and mm-hmm. instead of what the normal pattern was to always play the root of a chord, um, there were many times when Brian would use the third of a chord and create like a, you know, a line around that, and that influenced Paul a lot. So, in various ways, and also th- there's a lot of interesting sounds that came out of Pet Sounds and the, the animal effects mm-hmm. and stuff like that. Yeah. I do wonder if, right. any, if that and in any way influenced something like, you know, Good Morning, Good Morning, and, you know. Probably. I'm wondering. Uh, I'm wondering, uh, you know. Possibly. But, I, was listen- but, I, I was listening to that today. You know, but, I wonder if it, was, if it was an influence so much as, you know, the Beatles kind of doing what, you know, what they might have thought of almost as like an in-joke response to the Beach Boys by also putting animals on at the end of Good Morning, Good Morning. Right. You know, hmm. it might have been something like that. It's possible, but I, I, I think that particularly the, 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 the sort of musical landscapes that Brian created on, on Pet Sounds – uh, I think was extremely influential because I mean this was you know the, the and utilizing the you know the wrecking crew primarily uh, mm-hmm. in in these sessions in early in early sixty six and I mean there's a song on uh, on Pet Sounds called Let, uh, an instrument there are two instrumentals but one of them is called Let's Go Away for a While mm-hmm. and 
the mood that that song sets is is just absolute is just magnificent i mean it's you know it's you know pet sounds for me is a very special album because Mm -hmm. um you know it it wasn't easy being a teenager in the mid 60s and and pet sounds seem to say it all for a lot of us i mean was Mm -hmm. uh, you know um, i just wasn't made for these times may as well have been written written for me (laughs) <laughs> absolutely mm-hmm. and not alone you know so, yeah absolutely <laughs> but you know not only the personal aspect of it but just the the intense beauty of the arrangements on the uh-huh. album mm-hmm. that you can hear on the you know on the on the box set when you hear the you know the instrument you know strictly the instrumentals is just wonderful and supposedly uh when when Brian played the acetates of of Pet Sounds for Paul and for John, they were absolutely blown away. You know, not only the uh, the emotional effect that God only knows had on uh, had on Paul, but mm. just the the you know the influence of you know just this this magnificent musical piece, mm-hmm. and that certainly had to have influenced. Probably to some extent, uh, Revolver, but certainly Sergeant Pepper. Mm-hmm. You know, without without a doubt. I want to throw something out at the three of you, mm-hmm. <laughs> because this is something that my ears picked up, and it might only be me. But um, I love the whole Pet Sounds album. But I love "I'm Waiting for the Day." It's one of my favorite songs yeah. on there. And in the middle of that song, there is an instrumental part, which mm-hmm. sounds kind of like a fife and drum kind of a feel to it, and Whenever I listen to Let Him In, hmm. and you've got that kind of instrumentation, I'm thinking maybe he borrowed from that song. Do the three it's, of you ever think about that? I never did, but you might be right. Yeah, you very well might be right. Hmm. You know, because uh, Paul wasn't quite as much of a thief as as John was in stealing, you know, little little riffs and things like that. Hmm. But uh, but uh, it's it's very possible. Just in terms of the the arrangement there and the instrumentation, because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. after so many years of hearing "Let Him In" burn into my brain, and then listening to "I'm Waiting for the Day," I'm like, "That's like Let Him In." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, so I'm glad I'm not the only one that that uh, feels that way. And another thing that I think uh, Brian was a big influence on Paul on, although he hasn't really cited specific songs except like what you were saying uh, with "Here, There, and Everywhere." So many of Brian's songs, what he is so great at doing, are, are writing songs of melancholy. And yes. there's a lot of that in Pet Sounds. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. uh, Don't Talk. What a, what a masterpiece. Uh, yeah. Oh, my God. That's one of the greatest songs ever to me, along with God Only Knows. I can understand why Paul would say that God Only Knows, I've heard him say, is like, you know, one of the greatest songs ever written, if not the greatest. Some people feel that way. But... Um, a lot of Paul's songs have melancholy to them. Contrary to what Philip Norman said about him always being, you know, positive and happy with Good Day Sunshine, he also wrote For No One, you know, and he wrote uh, She's Leaving Home. You know, these are sad songs, sad stories to tell. And I do wonder if a lot of that rubbed off from the melancholy aspect of uh, what uh, Brian was bringing. It's possible. I mean, you've got, you've got two, two men there who were born two days apart. <laughs> and I've, I've always put out the challenge. And since we have a musicologist here <laughs> in Mr. Cozen, I'll, I'll <laughs> throw it out to him as well, that I absolutely challenge anybody to give me two composers in any musical stripe who were born two days apart who have given the world the amount of great music that Paul McCartney and Brian Wilson have. Hmm. Yeah, I probably can't do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. yeah, I mean, absolutely. Uh, I'm looking at I'm looking over the uh the list of the the box set uh the Pet Sounds 50th box set here. Do you guys um uh, I mean they came out with the stereo version a couple of years ago and uh, I mean as much as I love the stereo it, I almost kind of wish they hadn't done that but I mean I do love I do love the stereo what do you guys think of the stereo version it's it's okay 
uh, especially because of the fact that the, you know, there is so much going on musically. Mm-hmm. But you know, just you know, sort of emotionally, I've always been more comfortable with the mono. Mm-hmm. You know, because that's the one that I, you know, grew up on. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Especially since it it yeah. was out of print for so many years. Yes. Right. Right. Mm. And the beauty of that album is that you can listen to it time and time again and hear something you never heard before. Yes. Especially yeah. any instrumentation. Mm-hmm. You know, and uh, they say that about most of the great records of our time. So. Yeah. Yep. yep. <laughs> you know, what I also really liked about the, not this box set, but the older one, I think it was like four discs plus the stereo, um, mm-hmm. where you're hearing the sessions and... You're hearing not only the songs coming together, but you're hearing what Brian is telling the musicians. And Mm -hmm. that was the first time I really realized that, you know, he's not just sort of doing it by feel or intuition. He knows exactly what he wants and exactly what he's talking about and exactly who's playing a wrong note in a, you know, in a large group and, you know, where a, a rhythm is slightly off or anything like that and or what could be improved. And um, I, I just was fascinated listening to his direction. You know, it wasn't like, you know, it wasn't like, you know, George Martin sitting there doing it. It was Brian Wilson. And uh, mm-hmm. you know, I was very struck by that, you know. He, you know, again, I mean, he, he also is, is really self-taught, isn't he? I mean, he's, you yeah. know. Yeah, I thought that and, was really amazing. And that's one absolutely amazing thing about Brian. That he, he's such a musical savant that even with all of the the damage that he's done to himself over the years between the drugs and Dr. Landy and all the rest of it and and you know the fact that he's the only member of his family still alive uh with all of that he still is such a musical savant that he can still you know perhaps not in the same way that he could 50 years ago but he still can pick up on just tiny musical nuances mm-hmm. that that I, the average I, I, person would have no idea about I will I will never forget the time I interviewed Bruce Johnston and this was during the Landy period mm-hmm. And Johnston, Johnston told me that Brian had nothing left. And, you know, that was like the the blaring quote from the from the interview. Yeah. And, and um, it was it was amazing that he said that he actually had the nerve to say that. But he did. And um, and of course, time has proven that wrong. You know, he's still I mean, I'm amazed that he's out there. As much as he is, he's doing the you know pet sounds again, which by the way, if you had, I saw it several years ago, mm-hmm. and it it was absolutely stunning. If you can go see it, you should. I mean, he will put it. It's a it's a wonderful show to see, and if it doesn't put tears in your eyes, uh, I don't know what to tell you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, I, I will agree with you. But it, I've seen yeah. the show before. Yeah, and, me you know, too. He's, play, he's playing in my area in a few months, so I'm definitely going to try and see that show. So what about Dylan's influence on the Beatles? Because we've only got like 10 minutes left, so we, we should give him some time. <laughs> um. <laughs> well, I was going to say, Dylan Dylan had, a, a, a I think, more of a, a lyrical influence on the Beatles, really, because Dylan, you know, the, the, the Beatles, John Lennon saw how serious, you know, which way Dylan was going with his lyrics, and, and uh, I think John really... You know, took a took a hint from that. I mean, in more ways than one. But I yeah. mean, uh, I think that that had a lot to do with yeah. that. I mean, we see we see relatively early pictures of the Beatles um, when they have you know every now and then you see a photo of them with some records and and we've mm-hmm. seen them with Freewheeling. Yep. Um, so we know that they mm-hmm. were into him as of you know basically what was his second album, and uh, we know that. Yeah, the the big influence was lyrical, and I think maybe the most direct, directly traceable influence was, you know, on things like "I'm a Loser" and uh, you know, and and some of the Beatles for Sale stuff. Hide your love away. Yeah, but it was you know that was, this was shortly after they met for the first mm-hmm. time. They you know they did the American tour, then they came back and started on. Uh, 
Beatles for sale. And I, I think he described I'm a loser as his sort of Dylan period. I mean, he's got the harmonica and acoustic. Uh-huh. Like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and at the same time, I think that the Beatles being what they were kind of, I mean, do you, do you think if the Beatles hadn't come along and Dylan, you know, was a big folk star before they turned up. Do you think he would have gone electric? Wow. <laughs> that's a I tough kinda, question. That's, that's, I kind of think wow. that he liked the idea of, you know, an electric group. He I mean, he said, he said subsequently that he always wanted to be a rock star as a kid, you know. Um, so it's very possible that he might have anyway. But I kind of think that knowing that, you know, the Beatles and the Stones and everything that was going on was what it was. I think he just wanted to get in there and amplify too. Yeah, that's a, a good theory. Uh, it's probably probably has a. I think you can probably argue more for that than against it. I mean, uh, wow. Yeah, I hadn't. I'd never thought. Yeah, because I think you know the influence certainly of of the Beatles and the Stones and the other British bands, and then and then the Birds and all really did push him into you know going going electric. You know, because uh, which he did, you know, in in you know, in little uh, people think that it, all of a sudden, bang, you know, at uh, Newport in 1965, he suddenly went electric. But actually, he had been kind of tiptoeing toward it. He mm-hmm. had even done a uh, uh, a single uh, mix up confusion, right? Uh, pretty early, in, mm-hmm. in pretty early, uh, which was which which included electric instruments and of course half of bringing it all back home is electric as well mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. uh so it wasn't you know just you know the one big bang at newport you know but he was you know uh, and and but certainly the influence uh of the beatles was uh, was a major a major contrib- uh, a, a major contribution toward his going toward rock and going electric no mm-hmm. question, Alan. You've you've heard all those Dylan outtakes. What what do you? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I'm saying that out of jealousy. But I mean, do you see? You know, do you see some some definite things in there? I can't say that I do really. You know, I think it's just that he wanted that texture and he wanted that, you know, volume and power that comes with it. You know. Does he do any Beatles songs by chance? I don't think so. I mean, there is that 1970 session he did with George where they did Yesterday for a few seconds. Right, um, right. But, but I mean, he didn't do he didn't do anything like that in '65. No, no. What was no, the but, song that he did where he mixed "I Want to Be Your Man" into the lyrics? Hmm. It was a Dylan song where he used that line, "I want to be your lover, I want to be your man." Hmm. Oh. I can hear. I can hear the song. I can't think. Of it. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody write in and tell yeah. us. Well, I, I certainly think that you know all four Beatles were huge admirers of Dylan, but the influence is different with each of them because I don't yeah. hear any Dylan influence really in McCartney. I know that McCartney thinks very highly of him, and in fact, in the last few years, there was talk that maybe the two of them might write together. And uh, Paul Paul said that it wouldn't happen, but he referred to Dylan as a sweet genius. Mm. But if anything, it's really George, most of all, that felt the Dylan sure. presence. Oh, yeah. There's no doubt about yeah. it. And uh, apart from the fact that obviously the, the Traveling Wilburys happened with Bob Dylan and the group, I always sure. kind of felt that whenever you listen to George doing Dylan music, it sounds more natural <laughs> than with any other Beatle, really. And I love mm-hmm. when, when John did his parodies of Dylan. The stuff yeah. that wound up on the Lost Lennon tapes uh-huh. and um, the Lennon <laughs> anthology box set, but you know he was kind of making fun of them. With and I mean, even um, actually got a got to serve somebody was parodied right. by John. As serve, serve yourself. yourself. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. but that was a parody, really. <laughs> but um, when George did Dylan music, it sounded so natural. You know, it's like you could tell that he he really loved his music. When yeah. you hear George mm-hmm. doing something like. Mama, you've been on my mind. Mm-hmm. Or if not for you, what a what a great arrangement that was. Of if not for you, and all things must pass. It just right. seems like you know you could feel the influence and and you know the fact that George really kind of absorbed the whole Dylan thing. Some of the the original songs that George wrote, I feel are somewhat Dylan esque. Sure. Um, yeah. 
So oh, it yeah. was so it wasn't yeah, Lennon McCartney rubbing off on him all the time. It was also, no. Um, you know, he also came back from a, well, the Let It Be time. I mean, he was yeah. very very taken with the White Album of the band, uh-huh. which isn't Dylan exactly, but it you know it's pretty close. They did a lot of Dylan songs on that sure. album or a few, mm. um, and uh, you know I think it was that association as well. And and you hear him, you know, talking about the band on the on those session tapes and then playing Dylan songs, um, and of course Dylan turned up apparently just for a concert for Bonnie <laughs> Fesh. You know, mm-hmm. there are these interviews with, uh, you know, George gave, I think, uh, shortly after saying, you know, Bob Dylan kept, you know, saying he wasn't sure if he was going to come or not. And, and, and George just saying to him, listen, you know, I kind of need you there. You're used to this. I'm not, mm. <laughs> you know, I can't. I can't put together something where I don't know if someone's going to show up or not until the last minute. You got to do it, and he did it. And a lot of so. people look at that as being, you know, the highlight of the show for some people. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. yeah cause I, cause, well, you remember? I don't know. Well, at the time, you know, we used to. Me and my friends used to go to all these shows. Say, my friends and I used to go to all these shows. Uh, you know, in Central Park and other places. And if there was any reason, like if it was the band, or if there was any reason, people would be saying, "Dylan's going to show. Dylan's going to show." Uh-huh. And so yeah. finally, it was a concert where Dylan showed. You know, it, there was a certain amount of excitement about that. Yeah, because that was that was during a time when Dylan hardly did any live shows at all yeah. during you know from you know from when he had the motorcycle accident in july of 66 yeah. until he went back out on the road with the band in january of 74 he did just a very small handful of concerts yeah Isle of so, Light and, yeah uh, Isle, yeah exactly mm-hmm. exactly and uh and so it was you know it was a big deal at that point when he did when he did turn up for something like the concert for bangladesh because mm-hmm. there there was this mythology by yeah. this by this time around dylan yep yep I was going to say, Dylan, uh, you know, it's not that well known, but he did turn up during the Ram sessions in New York. He didn't play, mm-hmm. didn't do anything, but he he was there. They met. So, you know, actually, there's, you know, they, they all have some intersection with Dylan at some point, you know. So, yeah. Mm. Ken? For me, the, you're talking about the concert for Bangladesh, one of the greatest moments. And I love the whole concert, don't get me wrong. But when Bob and George and Leon Russell are hovering over the same microphone and they're all singing just like a woman the chorus of that i mean what a magical moment that is right there Mm -hmm. and um let's not forget um george also covered i don't want to do it right which he actually rehearsed during all things must pass you know an official version didn't come out till uh porky's revenge Mm -hmm. uh soundtrack and george also turned up for the 30th anniversary tribute to dylan that's and right. uh, did a great rockin' version of Absolutely Sweet Marie, which, uh, you know, we're mentioning Blonde on Blonde here. That's right. So, sure. That's right. Along with Just yeah. Like a Woman. You know. And as it happened, that was the last time that George Harrison ever appeared on an American stage. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm. And I was there. Yeah. <laughs> oh, hush. <laughs> <laughs> That's such a great. That's a great concert as a whole, and and the uh, the bootleg footage of them doing the rehearsals is are, is really good. Too. Yeah. So. Yeah. And to kind of bring things up to date, we were talking a few weeks ago about Kisses on the Bottom, uh, you know Paul McCartney's album of pop standards. Uh, it, within the last year, Dylan had released an album of songs associated with Frank Sinatra, and has just now released a, uh, a sequel and uh our our good friend tom frangione sent me four tracks from it and plus i had uh, come across another track on youtube last night and it's um if anything it's it's even better and more accessible than this last album Mm-hmm. I've heard that they are all from the same sessions, actually. Are I'm they sure. really? I'm not, I'm not sure if that's right, but I've I've read that somewhere. Um, yeah, the new one is called Fallen Angels. For yeah, to go get it. 
Um, yeah. So, uh, and also, you know, we, we've talked various times about, um, you know, Dylan, uh, for instance, when he put out the $600, uh, set of 1965, 66, right. Right. um, of all the studio outtakes and how a few weeks later, buyers of that set got an email from Columbia Records saying, and by the way, we're giving you downloads of like another 12 discs worth of live stuff, mm -hmm. um, which wasn't mm -hmm. expected. So now with Dylan, um, he's playing here in Portland in a few weeks and I bought tickets and a few days later got an email saying okay you have bought tickets to the show and we're sending you his new album for free I thought that was really nice yeah. how to treat your fans you know yeah, yeah. Uh, Apple could take a page from his playbook I think I certainly <laughs> could uh, so earlier are, we so earlier we were asking if Dylan ever covered a Beatles song and uh, just um, said today yeah, he did things we said today for the Art of McCartney, the tribute album to Paul right. that came out. Oh, right, right of course. Right. So right, I thought Steve was talking about during those sixty-five, sixty-six sessions. Right? I, I was, right. I, I was originally, but yeah. that's interesting too. That's interesting too. Let me bring up something really, really quick. Did you guys see the picture of the Hollywood Vampires with Anne Murray? Nope. No. It floated around. Uh, I think uh, Mickey Dolan sent it out last. Or no, Alice Cooper sent it out last week. <laughs> it's got. Uh, I'm looking at it now. It's got John, Harry Nilsson, Alice Cooper, Mickey Dolan's, and Anne Marie. Oh, I've, the, uh, yeah, I've seen that picture. You did yeah. see that? Sure. Apparently, they they all went to Anne's concert. I thought that that was the picture of the week. That was amazing huh. to see that picture. Mm. I haven't seen it. What a group. Yeah. What a group. Look, it's on Facebook. It's all over Facebook. But it's a great picture if you have not seen it. Okay. So so we are about at the end of our hour. And uh, so uh, you can get in touch with each of us on our Facebook pages. Do we want to go around and each give, a, give ways of doing this? Well, Ken has other stuff too. So, Ken, why don't you start? Uh, my Facebook page is... Very simply, under the name Ken Michaels, it's a picture of me, my family with Todd Rundgren. Please mm -hmm. like me. I'm very likable. Also, <laughs> go to my website, KenMichaelsRadio.com, for Beatles Triv every single week, uh, special contests quite frequently, and lots of interviews with people connected to the Beatles. And my email address, if you want to reach me directly, is everylittlething at att.net. Okay, Over and Steve? I'm on Facebook under my name. I have a Beatles news group called Beatles News and Commentary, where I po where I post uh, stories and and we talk about events like we did this week. And um, you can get to the show. You can write us and and say whatever you want about the show. Tell us you love us. Tell us you you know whatever at things we said today radio show at gmail dot com like my page like my news page like our gr our group page and our radio page we want likes 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 hmm. lots of likes and there's our twitter address um, at yes, at things we said things fab, we said fab right uh, so right. al Facebook, Al Sussman, uh, Twitter, at ASUSS49, or through Beatle Fan Magazine, www.beatlefan.com, or uh, www.paradingpress.com for uh, Changing Times, uh, 101 Days of Shape the Generation. Okay. And you can reach me on Facebook at Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed or through the email address Steve gave. This is me clicking my mouse. Hear it? Someone offered to send me $2 to not do it. Um, and so I will uh, write to me again, and I'll send you my address. That's if it was me. We, we haven't established that it was my mouse he was hearing, but um, I hope there were no mice during this show. And uh, so for... Uh, Al Sussman and Steve Marinucci and Ken Michaels. This is Alan Cozen saying see you next time. Mm -hmm.